You may have noticed the new edge lighting section of layers that Photoshop's sky replacement feature creates. This is actually a new setting that's inside of the sky replacement window. And in this tutorial, we'll take a look at that setting and why it's there. It's essentially there to help ease the transition between your foreground and your new sky. It doesn't take too long to explain, but I would encourage you to watch until the end because I, I explain what it does, but I also think it's really important to know what the, the setting does, but also to know when you're supposed to use it. What types of photos was that setting introduced for? Because to me, that's actually probably the most important part. Okay, so we'll take a look at both aspects of what it does inside of Photoshop, but also talk a little bit about the why afterwards. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into Photoshop. Uh, we're going to start out with this photo and what I'll do is I'll just delete the sky replacement group and we'll start this one from scratch. I'll head up here to the edit menu and we'll go down to sky replacement. And inside of the sky replacement window, let's go to Adobe's default spectacular section and we'll choose something like this because this is going to be the best demonstration of, of, of what we're talking about here. I'm going to press command or control plus to zoom in. And then once I'm zoomed in, I can hold down my space bar key and that'll give me that little hand tool and then I can pan around the photo. Now, what we're talking about here is this edge lighting. Everything else in here is the same, all right? But what we're talking about here is edge lighting. And I do have a tutorial from a while back that explains everything inside here. So I'll make sure that that uh, has a link in here as well. But the edge lighting one is new. And what I found is it pretty much defaults to 70 for everything. I haven't, I haven't opened one where it hasn't, but maybe it does, I don't know. But we're gonna bring it down to zero because that, that's, the, that's the, the zero setting means no changes are being applied to this, okay? And by Adobe's own explanation, if you were to go look on their website, they're talking about that halo effect that can occur uh, along the edge here. You don't see it everywhere. All right. You don't see it as much where the sky intersects with a bright sky, because if you look at the before image and you look at the after image, if you get an overall general tone of brightness, the sky should look pretty good. But you'll be generally unsuccessful replacing a bright sky with a dark sky where you can see it's a lot darker over here. And again, you got to watch to the end because this is only going to take a couple minutes to explain where I'll give you my personal opinion on this whole thing, because I, I don't necessarily think this is going to be the right sky replacement for this. But this edge here by Adobe's own definition is what they're working on. And again, by Adobe's own definition, they're saying where you're replacing a bright sky with a dark sky or vice versa. So you can see there's a halo along there. I'll zoom in a little bit more for you. You can see there's a little halo along there. It just, it looks awkward. It looks, it looks pasted on. So that's where we go down to edge lighting and we can start to increase that. And you'll see number one, the halo starts to get neutralized a little bit. And number two, there's an overall transition where it helps try to balance that transition between bright and dark. I would say the best way to, to look at these settings, any setting, and to learn it is to try the extremes. Put it down at zero, crank it up to 100, put it down at zero, crank it back and forth, and just see what it does. And that's a really good way to learn any setting inside of Photoshop or Lightroom. So as you can see here, it's giving a little bit, it's taking a little bit away from that halo and it's giving us a better transition between the foreground and the sky there. All right, so when I'm done, I can click okay and that'll commit. And as you were to look at this, I would say if you're a photographer, you're gonna know that the sky was replaced. Um, and it depends who your audience is. You know, if I were to show a photographer, of course they're gonna know. And I don't think that's that's the, you know, I, I generally don't try to please other photographers because you never will. But uh, what I would say, if, if I showed it to my dad, my dad would be like, oh, wow, that's beautiful. So you have to look at who your audience is for this stuff. But uh, it looks very, very, to me, this looks very, very fake. But that transition does start to look a little bit better. So let's take a look at one more example and then we'll talk about you know, whether or not you really need this setting. Again, we'll head up here to the edit menu. We'll go down to sky replacement. And in this one, let's go choose a different one. I'll go into one of my sky libraries here and I'll choose one of my sunrise sunset ones, something along those lines there. 
I can think of no better time for a very quick 60 second word from our sponsor. Uh, if you like this sky replacement stuff here, I've got two things you might be interested in. One is a sky replacement pack that I have on sale on my website. It's got 40 of my favorite skies that I've created over time, along with tutorials on what types of photos they work best with. And then there's another one. It's a fairly new little mini course that I created. It's just an hour long. It's called No Sky, No Problem, where I use your photos. People that follow me have sent in photos and they're hard to replace sky. So it's not just a one click, you're done. Um, because the sky replacement feature works pretty pretty well and pretty fast, but these are hard to replace ones. Blown out skies, um, you know, sky reflections. Uh, what do you do if there's not enough space for the sky, where the sky was too small um, and you want to extend it and replace it? There's a couple of things and hoops you have to jump through to get it done. So they're both on sale over on the website. I'll make sure I put links in the description. I hope you'll swing by and check them out. Okay, back over to our tutorial. Okay, we're back over into the tutorial here. And remember, we just applied this sky onto this photo here. This was the original, all right? And then we'll apply the sky here. And the edge lighting will pull back down to zero because it put it back at 70. So what we're gonna wanna look at is the, you know, the transition line between foreground and background. And we, we applied a darker sky to what was originally a brighter one where there's a bright blue behind a lot of here. And we applied something that I think is, is dark, almost too dark. And that's where you see it. That's where to me, it looks pasted on. When you see a transition like that with a dark sky and a bright foreground, there's just something that's wrong. It just doesn't look right. All right, so we'll press Command or Control Plus a couple times, I can zoom in. So I see it a lot more here than I do in some of those brighter areas, but again, just test out the edge lighting setting and you can see it's not just working on that halo because if you pay attention to the tones that you see inside the mountain here and outside the sky here when you crank that up you see it's actually darkening that whole area there which is making it a little bit more believable it's not darkening it way into the mountain over here but it is darkening that transition line between the foreground and the sky so will it make it more believable it will it definitely, it definitely sells it more than what we had here because you can't see that bright outline there and it is a better transition. But as we, you know, same thing as I said before, if I go in there and I looked at something like this, to me, you know, I think a lot of people would say something just looks off here when you look at some of the bright area in the foreground and some of the darker sky and clouds that are behind it. So that leads me to, uh, to talk a little bit about when do you use this feature? You know, what, what's, what's the impact of this feature? I think overall edge lighting can help. On, on any photo, I think it can help. But by Adobe's own definition, this was created for halos and for replacing a dark sky with a bright one or replacing a bright sky with a dark one. I would say, if you're doing that, just be aware that you're doing something really unnatural. Okay, that doesn't exist in the real world. And you have to understand that. I, I look at the image that Adobe uses on the page where they describe this and it looks kind of cool, but it's it's totally fake. You know, when you look at it, you can see that there's shadows and highlights, which means the sun is out. And when you look at the sky that they replaced it with, it, it is 100% the sun is down. That sky does not exist when the sun is up. You don't get that type of a sky. So you're you're mixing two different two different images from two different times of the day, and while it can look cool, and if that's what you're after, you should go for it. Don't worry about the purists that say that's not real, it doesn't look right. If that's what you're after, go for it. There's a lot of people that will love it. I said it earlier, my dad would look at it and be like, that's amazing, that's crazy, I love it. You know. And then there's certain people that'll look at it and say, well, that doesn't look real. You gotta figure out which, which category that you're in and just understand the limitations, understand where the setting came in. And that for some of you that might be a little bit more looking for something realistic, you might not get as much of this setting, probably still a little bit, but for somebody trying to do something a little bit more otherworldly, um, I think the setting can come in a lot more handy, okay? Also, one of the things that's missing out of the sky replacement window is reflections. And if you're interested, I have a tutorial right here that's free to watch. So if you haven't seen how you can coax it to, uh, to also do a reflection, that would be a great place to go next.